Hey everyone, you're listening to the 107 podcast where we get together every fortnight and sometimes more often to talk about technology, business and the humans in it. I'm your host Ivan Stegic. My guest today is Lynn Winter, who is a seasoned digital strategist and has been managing teams and projects and people for so many years. She's also the founder of Manage Digital, an actual conference with real people in the same space for digital project managers that's scheduled right now for a new date in August of this year. She's also a videographer and has worked many popular events, including the Super Bowl. And she's also been on the podcast a number of times before. So welcome back to the show, Lynn. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Though I said, kind of from your intro, I sound really old. I'm very seasoned. <laughs> I, was, I don't think you're old. You're experienced. and um... Maybe it's just... These days feel feel old and long. <laughs> oh, they do. And it feels like I don't know what day it is anymore. It could be the weekend tomorrow. I don't know. I thought it was May yesterday. <laughs> it's fine. It's almost May. <laughs> Unprecedented time, isn't it? Um, it I mean, is. <laughs> I hear that word a lot. Unprecedented. And uh, it really is. It, like, who lives through a pandemic? It's pretty insane. So uh, let me ask you, how are you faring? How's, I hope your family's good. I hope everyone you love is safe and healthy. Yeah, yeah. I think we have probably the same complaints that most people have and that you maybe have is, you know, we have elementary school age children at home trying to learn. I was working on multiplying fractions this morning. Um, so, you know, we're trying to get work done. Um, we got one unemployed family member and trying to live in a world at home when I'm a complete extrovert. Um, but we're healthy. And so um, that's all that matters. And we know some people that have diagnosed and passed away. And so it's really hard. But right now, I'm just blessed to have a happy, healthy, you know, family at home. I'm sorry to hear that um, with your friends. That's awful. It it is. But Uh, you know, everybody has these stories. And we're going to continue to hear these stories. So the more we can stay home and stay safe, I think, is the best we can do for everybody. Totally agree. Stay at home, everybody. Wash your hands. Stay at home. That <laughs> sounded the... it was really heavy to start with, but <laughs> no, no. <laughs> sorry. Not at Bad all. news yesterday. So. <laughs> I'm so sorry. But we're doing I'm okay. so sorry. Good, good, good. Well, um, I want to talk about how the pandemic has affected you, but maybe in um, in your work life, and what it might look like when this whole thing subsides. So. You know, you wear a lot of hats. You're a consultant. You're a a, a conference organizer. You've you're into videography as well. Your husband, you mentioned, was was unemployed because of that. So I'd like to get into how this has all affected you. But let's start with your consulting business, right? We we work together on a pretty regular basis, right? You're our Mm go-to content strategist. and we're typically pretty hands-on with our clients in the early stages of the project, right? We kind of spend time in their space, in their conference room. We use post-it notes. We spend nine to five in a meeting room. Lots of people jam-packed together. You're kind of not doing that anymore, are you? No, we, we really aren't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, I kind of described what something typical in a discovery process might look like, very high level. Do you want to expound on that a little bit? Like, what do we, what do you normally do, um, and then how has that changed in like the couple of recent projects that we've done? Yeah, so I mean, it, it depends really where we're starting with the project, when the project goals are. But essentially, um, most of the discovery meetings are in person, hands on, and they involve um, key stakeholders and maybe some extra stakeholders that need to be kind of making some high level decisions about goals and where the you know, content and marketing is going for the organization. And we like to make it more interactive as possible. So it does involve post-it notes and whiteboards. Sometimes there's um, card sorting going on and anything to make it kind of a process really to help people think through where we're going. Um, So uh, the more hands-on it is, the better energy we have, the better outcomes. And so shifting now to not being in person is really different. Around that, you know, we have moved essentially the first couple of weeks is, okay, we had this meeting. Now let's just do it on Zoom. Okay. And now we're doing this meeting on Zoom. 
Um, and the first couple of weeks is really about just like everyone be home. Can you meet at this time? Do you have children? How are we going to get this done? And so it was really more about that. Um, and now we've all kind of hit the Zoom overload and mm. those meetings that aren't producing the same results. And now that we've been in it for a while, it's time to kind of shift through how we can really deliver stuff. So I've kind of been thinking about some things that I've done and I've kind of got some goals for the future. Yeah, one of the projects that uh, we were working on together, you kind of shifted the strategy and instead of meeting in person, you gave homework to clients. Yeah, and it, honestly, we did that because they said they can't meet. <laughs> so it, it started with a need, right? Right. And it's been something that we've carried through with other clients um, because it's worked much better. So um, what I found is that they couldn't, they didn't feel like they could meet in per, like on the phone and in a remote call and have that kind of first initial dialogue. And I've never met with this client before um, besides just like a hello and how are you doing kind of situation. And so we really had to take the dialogue we'd have instead of just an agenda, but like really work through like what is what do we need the outcome that meeting to be? What are the steps they need to go through? And like, how do we then take a process where we maybe put like 40 words on a table and they need to sort and organize them? How do they do that together? And so we assign them homework and that client particularly did a great job. And it's partly because clients have more focused on interrupted time. Mm. They have this ability to really hunker down and really think through. So in the past, when you get to meet them in person, and they're in their offices and they have all those interruptions, they don't give you as good a feedback outside the meeting and you needed that meeting. Now the meeting, it's kind of flipped. The meeting has been le uh, less valuable often. Um, it's just not as dynamic and people are separated and then people need to go and take care of something in the meeting and stuff. And really the, the, that homework time is actually producing some better results. So I've kind of taken some meetings and either shortened them because long Zoom meetings are unproductive anyway, breaking them into multiple meetings and thought through like, what can I assign them as homework that I can get really good value to bring to that meeting beforehand? So how do you get the best of both worlds then? Like let's, let's look medium to long term because we've mm -hmm. obviously learned something from this. You've found a way to get even better uninterrupted feedback from the client. But yet there's this value in being in person. So how, like, what do you think happens going forward? How do we learn from this? Yeah, well, I think, uh, you know, a lot of it's really around the management and planning is really thinking through, which we should do all the time, right? Mm -hmm. But we kind of get into rhythms of like, this is what the media is. Everyone's got a role. Okay, we're going to show up and we're going to get some out of it. But I think we have to be a little more thoughtful. Like, really, what is our goal? What do we have to accomplish by the end? What are the best ways to do that? Like, you know what? I don't think, you know, this isn't a time period. This is a change in our life. Mm. And I don't think even if all of a sudden it goes away, right, and there's no worry about, you know, getting sick, I think people are still going to work from home more. And it's going to change that up, that we're not going to always be in the office. And so we have to come up with a game plan for different scenarios. I think you're right. I don't think this means that everybody is going to work from home, period. Uh, mm -hmm. Companies are now forced to be a little more serious about having a work from home policy and having an opinion and being more flexible about how their employees work for them. I was just talking to someone today and um, I was saying before I used to say, oh, you know, this whole pandemic, it's a temporary thing. It'll pass. We'll some things will change. We'll pretty much go back to the way it was before, I hope. Now I'm like this person brought up the comparison with 9-11 where basically everything changed and nothing went back to the way it was. And now I'm starting to think, mm -hmm. well, I think there's going to be more of an effect than I thought. And it's not just going to be working from home. I think there's going to be more people wearing masks for longer periods of time and us maybe even thinking about like how we behave when we're out in public where before there was like, how does it affect going mm -hmm. to see a show or a bar or a concert? Like what it's, it's so unknown right now. Mm -hmm. And if you start to read some of the projections of what they think they're going to do with colleges and schools, 
that looks extremely different, which will impact how we work or our ability to be available. I mean, nine to five, you know, mm, it hasn't yeah, been a too. thing for me mm-hmm. for a while <laughs> because I do consulting work, but I think it's going to be the, that way for everybody now. I think it's going to really shift. I mean, talking about sh- cutting class sizes, maybe these are the days your kids go to school. These are the days they work from home. Um, I, it's just a very different world. And so I think when it comes to projects, we have to think about, we have to like take our game plan and like multiply it. Like well, here are the different scenarios. Here's our toolbox mm-hmm. and we need to grow those options and then kind of really be thoughtful about what do I need to bring to the table at what moment? Yeah. I, I didn't realize they were talking about uh, spending a couple days at home and then a couple in three days at school. I, I didn't realize those conversations had started like that already. I, Wow. So um, your kids are then, you're ex- are you expecting that to happen in the fall with your kids? I don't, you know, I think it's so early to know. I mean, we're coming out of the stay at home in Minnesota, right, in a couple of days, but yet our numbers are jumping up drastically in the last two days. So it's really, it's hard to know that. For me, I'm just trying to think through the summer plan because we had all the summer camps. And even if they're allowed to go, do I want them to go? Um, so I, th- I think it's different. And my, my oldest child is jumping into middle school. And so trying to navigate having one teacher to having like six different teachers and if some of that's remote. And I mean, I think the whole education world, you know, from kindergarten, early education to, to college, it has to rethink, you know, what yeah. does getting work done look like and how do we how do we use those tools and, and what do grades mean anymore? I mean, we've already kind of flipped the, the switch on, you know, what ACT and SETs mean because the people are paying for them. So the whole system, I think, is just having this big rattle and it's going to continue to happen. Um, but I know for my kids, they're on screens all day now. We didn't, you know, I'm not perfect by any means, but we have, yeah. you know, we were limited with them for screens and oh, now my no. daughter's getting headaches. And so, you know, because it's just a lot of time to sit on an iPad, and that's where all their homework is. So, yeah, I I saw there might have been a mm-hmm. bit of an accident with um, one of your child's computers, <laughs> <laughs> a laptop. The laptop. <laughs> you know that la- that laptop had a very hard life, and it was about six years old, so it, it was already on the end of its life. And my husband maybe left it at, at the Boston airport a year ago. Maybe left in security and didn't bring really? it home, and they shipped it three weeks later. And it had a, it, the whole screen was cracked. So at that point, we're like, it's old. He'll get a new one. My daughter can use it. But then she dumped water over the entire <laughs> thing. <laughs> and I was uh-huh. like, well, I'll just blow dry it quick. And I thought, you know, if I blow dry at the same temperature that I use my blow dryer for myself, no big deal. No. I'm telling you, everybody. Yeah, don't use a blow hair dryer on a keyboard. <laughs> it melts all your keys. <laughs> I, but it, how can it melt the keys far away when I put it closer <laughs> to my head? <laughs> like I'm starting to question what I'm doing to well, myself every day. <laughs> so, of course, it's turning back on, but the keys are totally waxed. So. <laughs> Yep. Oh, yeah. Oh, it's totally God. functioning. Well, at, least that, at least that's a good thing, I suppose. But maybe a good reason to get a new computer, huh? Well, yeah. Well, I think we, we just shifted to an iPad. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, let's talk a little bit about your like pet project that's actually a thriving business, your conference, Manager Digital. Now, uh, I'm pretty sure it was about – It was, wasn't it supposed to be like today? <laughs> It was, oh today. it was today. Oh man, <laughs> it's so, so sad. sorry. So it's not <laughs> happening. Just for those of you that are listening, yep, not today. It's not um, today. But it is on again in August. So um, you've rescheduled it. You're you're hedging your bets that we're all going to mm-hmm. be good and and available and in person in August. Which I mean, I, I would agree. I think that's a smart bet. At what point in leading up to your decision to like, okay, we need to shift this. Like what was the turning point? What was the thing that said, okay, yeah, I absolutely have to change this date. There was a hockey game for the Minnesota wild that was scheduled in the beginning of March. And my husband had gone to work there and I was supposed to work there later that night. And he called me and he said, they're sending us all home. The season is canceled. And that was the day after the NBA um, mm. had a player uh, test positive. 
And it was at that moment I knew it was not going to happen. Um, but I needed time to figure out what that meant um, uh, because I am a single entity that puts on the, the conference. It's, it's a big financial situation for me. So I needed to reach out to the venue, reach out to the speakers, talk to the sponsors and just see, is this an option for everyone? Um, and so at that point, the conference is like, you can definitely move it. We will be flexible and it's adjustable. So I tried to pick a date that was far mm-hmm. enough out that we could we could hopefully make it because so much of the value of the conference is seeing people in person and building those relationships and connecting with with those people. Net, that mm-hmm. networking of actually seeing those people yeah 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 and of course so the venue is the American Swedish Institute um, down in Minneapolis and they like just from their pers- perspective uh, they must have been totally freaked out about all of this as well, right? I mean, they're a museum, they're a nonprofit, they have a gift shop, so retail, and they have a restaurant, so uh, restaurant industry, and plus they do like uh, you know events. How how did um, mm-hmm. how did that work with them? Were were they like what was their approach? You know, honestly, I think I was not the first person to contact them. So they were pretty calm about it. And they already had in play, like, here's the policy. Um, Because I had called them before the official lockdown, um, that it was, you know, you can, you can lose the deposits and cancel and that's, that's fine. We can also, you know, let you just move it within a year time span. So they were totally flexible about that. I think they honestly, the bigger problem for them is really the, you know, attendance in the museum as well as venue or weddings. Mm, they do a lot. They do of a lot weddings of weddings, there. especially in the Probably summer. Probably less mm-hmm. events. Um, a couple hospitals use them regularly that are nearby, but I think they do more weddings than anything. Mm. And I, so I think that is probably more of a challenge. But they kind of just know that, you know, they've been talking to other venues in the in the Twin Cities and trying to figure out what's the stance on it. And so they, I thought they were more than fair that you can move it. Um, but I, I mean, it, it makes sense that they can't give back everyone's deposit. Yeah. That would, that would decimate them as a nonprofit. And so I can't even imagine what it's like for um, the Drupal Association or, or for Confab to to have to mm-hmm. rearrange and replan and do all of that work for a for a, you know, an order of magnitude more in the number of people that attend it. I'm hoping to be talking to someone at the Drupal Association soon. Maybe we could get them on the podcast. And then um, Christina hopefully will be on the podcast as well. We'll ask her about Confab. Did you ever consider making Managed Digital virtual? Like, was that even ever a thought? Well, it is now. So I think at some point, if August, you know, I don't want anyone to feel in jeopardy or if there's any danger out there, it doesn't make any sense to put anyone in danger. So um, it is still a consideration that at some point we might need to go virtual versus delaying until maybe next year. Because I think there's, I mean, I was really, really excited about the content lineup and the talks that people were giving. So I'd hate to kind of push that too far off. I still would want people to be able to have that information. Mm-hmm. But I am just kind of waiting and seeing, you know, if, if things are kind of slowing down, we are, you know, as far as the states in the U.S., Minnesota is one of the best situated states when it comes to coronavirus, as far as, you know, infections per capita. But at the same time, you know, one, right. still oh, one yeah. you know, <laughs> so we just have to kind of wait and see. We still have got time before any sort of pivot would need to be made for that. So I'm, I'm just kind of. I've been um, attending some virtual conferences and just kind of seeing what's working for them, what's challenging. Um, I still would hate to shift to that because I think the in-person is is definitely Mm -hmm. lost. But, you know, I've got to be open to it because this might be, you know, longer. I mean, they're talking about canceling sports seasons and not letting people go back to college. I mean, you've just got to pivot, you know. As a sponsor, we're happy to support you in whatever decision you make, and we will be around for that, and we will be around next year as well. So you have our support, and we, you know, I wish you the best, and I, I hope um, it works out well for all of the attendees and for the content, because the content is basically what you want people to have, and you know, the networking is a big part of it, and you know, I wish you the best with that. Thank you. 
Thank you for your support. You bet. Um, and you were talking about professional sports. You mentioned the Hockey League being canceled. I was just reading this morning about how the Baseball League, the MLB, are planning tentatively in June. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Personally, I think that's a little optimistic. Or technically, it's the end of June. It's so. the end of June. <laughs> like it's, July. <laughs> it's, it's also an unsubstantiated report based on anonymous sources, so... You know, but it's interesting what they're talking about. Like they're talking about reducing the number of games and changing the leagues so that they're geographic as opposed to, you know, cross country. So that's I think that's kind of smart. Like that's a good idea. You have some experience with professional sports. You've worked the Super Bowl, which I always think is really cool. (laughs) It was cool. (laughs) (laughs) But what do you do about other team sports and individual sports like hockey and football and tennis and a large portion of the of the community of the uh community of the economy Uh of like there are so many industries that get affected that you haven't even thought about yeah it was interesting because really sports was the first thing to go and there's so many people on unemployment and and trying to figure things out um but it sports and events was like the kind of the first wave so it hit us i mean you know I do sports more on the side, um, but that it's my husband's full-time work. You know, he um, crews events at the convention center. He works events and sports. Um, so it kind of, it's been something we've been really paying attention to of how that changes. And when we, when do we go back to work? Um, so every sport's been very different though. Um, football has not released their schedule yet, which should have been out in early April. They're waiting to see what happens. And so they haven't finalized um, when the NFL is happening. Uh, ha- when does that start? Does that start August or September? Usually? Um, we, there are preseason games in July. Oh, so, so even sooner. Preseason's very oh, long. long. Okay. Um, so, you know, the, they're certainly going to be shifting from that, but they, you know, I, I can't remember when uh, camp starts, probably in June. So, Um, They'll have to have some sort of shift. The X Games have been canceled, which has been held at Minneapolis for the last two years, and the third year was going to be this year. Um, Hockey is looking at a regional plan um, in which – I shouldn't say regional because that's more of the baseball plan. But what they're doing is looking at four different places to play. And so the regional teams would come and stay at that location and just play in their arena. And that Minnesota is one of those places Mm. they're considering. So that would include like Detroit and Chicago, um, obviously Winnipeg. Um, Doesn't Winnipeg have a team? Probably Winnipeg makes sense. So what they are doing is that once they think it's ready to start, they will bring in all the players that are out of the country and they will have a couple of weeks um, in quarantine. And once everything passes, they'll start to work out as a team and then they will come back and finish some sort of version of of the season. And it's a big financial thing because the playoffs bring in so much money um, for them. Cause I was kind of thinking maybe the NBA and, and hockey would just drop, but there's a lot of yeah. money in that kind of thing. So they're looking to start in July, which is a very interesting time. Yeah, to play right hockey. in the middle of the summer. Jeez. Yep. And the Minnesota United, which I work those games for broadcast, um, they're on hold and they have hopes because their games are more spread out. They still have hopes of maybe making up mm. a lot of the season um, when and if that comes back. So yeah, Their season is long, but it's a short number of games and there's a whole bunch of time in between, right? Yeah, I so. think it runs from like March to October. So um, they've already had a couple games, um, Not no home game. Well, they had, no, they missed the first home game, but um, they've had a couple on the road games, so they've started the season, so they have a, a leg up on that. But well, yeah. it is, it really is. <laughs> you know, and it's it's the camera people, it's the it's the broadcast people, it's the people that sell you the food, it's the ushers, it's security. It's there's so many folks involved. Is hospitality that that is in the hotels yep. and the restaurants and the bars around the facilities, and then when you watch and rewatch all of those video feeds, it's all the advertising dollars that are being pushed into the um, video streams that go out. Right? I mean, there's like that part of the industry That's too about that is that um, the subscription fees are still there. So the folks that own, you know, ESPN, Sinclair, um, Disney, the folks that own 
the rights are still getting paid the subscription fees because you still have been paying for your that's broadcast, true. I'm going right? to watch CNN right? and not a, so uh, they're actually mm-hmm. making yeah. the money, and that's actually kind of a bit controversial, and it's been in the news because um, the folks at um, what we call Big Fox, as um, F, you know, something you'd see on late night on Channel Nine, they're getting paid for the events they're missing, but. Um, if you look at the sports broadcast in our area, that's a regional. And so there's a lot of regional people that are not getting paid because they're owned by a different organization. Mm. And so those folks are, are kind of stuck and have nothing coming in. That's awful. And so it's just, it's been different how people are dealing with it. Like I was supposed to work for NBC for a hockey game and they paid me. And it was a week after things got canceled, which is wonderful. It's great that they supported us in that way. Wow. So. Do you think there's going to be any technology disruption or other kind of changes to the way that events are run and broadcast, you know, medium to long term? Like we talked about, okay, maybe work from home is affected by big companies. What about... Um, Camera operators, are we going to see more robotic, robotic cameras? Are we going to see more vending machines in the stadiums? Like, do you think, you know, do you think there's a... <laughs> that, wouldn't that be great? Like a big thing you stick and your hand in? And... <laughs> fresh hot dog. <laughs> fresh hot dog. <laughs> you, you know, it's hard for me to imagine, like, the service part and the people being gone, like, completely. Um, but you might be right. There might be a table of... Like the way that your drink is delivered is different, but right. I can't imagine a stadium not being yeah. packed full of people. Like that would be really, it'd be really it sad. Um, with, you know, equipment wise, everybody, you know, when you go to set up your stuff, you're kind of by yourself. Um, there is an ability to separate and kind of be more isolated. So whether it's a robotic camera or a hard camera or someone, that you, like a handheld, which is something you run on your shoulder. I mean, people kind of set up their own thing. So I think, I don't think moving to more robotic cameras would necessarily change mm. the exposure of those folks. Um, though my ham Hunson is a robotic camera <laughs> operator, so we're safe. <laughs> I am not at all, <laughs> but he Isn't is. He... So. I guess Does he do the, dr- the drone footage or the footage that's like the aerial stuff? He used to do oh, the he sky cam okay. and cable cam. Yeah, I, I always tease him because he peaked in his <laughs> early 20s. And then he decided to stay home and have a family. So it's not as exciting anymore. But, yeah. um, but uh, you know, those things take, you know, an A-person crew that's to crazy. get set up. That's crazy. Wow. So, I, I'm not sure. I mean, I, I said to him, like, is it possible that you could sit in our conference room at home and just like run your camera from here? Because that would be amazing. Like, like dad's going to go upstairs, leave him alone till the game's done. And then, then poof, then he's right. He just walks down the stairs and he's done. And he's done. Yeah. That would be pretty cool. It would be awesome. But I, I think, you know, step one is shooting without anyone in the crowds and seeing how that happens. Cause I think honestly, the players are more at risk likely Uh, than the crew i mean everybody would be but the players are sweating Mm. and spitting and all that kind of close contact would be more challenging for them so if they can create a safe space for them i think that's that's the start i think you're right though i think there isn't a way to replace or for crowds watching of an event like that to go away like we are fundamentally other people based right we're community based we want to be mm-hmm. in a place where there are other people watching something that we could all you know support and agree on and team sports are a wonderful way to do that so i can't imagine not being able to go down to the target field with with my son and my daughter to watch the twins play like that that would be hard you know it, I, yeah it would be yeah. And, uh, you know, they'll probably find different ways to, you know, have like a private group chat on your screen while you're watching the game at home so you can talk about the game with your friends, but only your friends. Or I think it will take apps and social media into a whole new sports venue that we haven't seen. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Great insights. It's been so awesome to talk to you. Glad that you're happy and safe and Got kids with uh, water-filled keyboards. <laughs> Thank you so much for spending your time with me today. It's been great. Oh, yeah, thanks for having me as always. I really enjoy it.
Lynn Winter is a digital strategist and the founder of Manage Digital, a conference for digital project managers happening this August in Minneapolis. She's online at lynnwintermn.com, and she's on Twitter as at lynnwintermn. And of course, Manage Digital has its own website, too. You can check that out at managedigital.io. You've been listening to the 107 Podcast. Find us online at 107.com slash podcast. And if you have a second, do send us a message. We love hearing from you. Our email address is podcast at 107.com. Until next time, this is Ivan Stegich. Thank you for listening. 